Wax off. <laughs> Wax on. Wax off. I never quite know when the Facebook Live goes. There's always a delay. You put the button, you hit go, and then wax on, wax off. I don't know if it's actually working. So, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, frankly, Frankie Finn proudly brings to you our weekly Q&A. That's an old school wrestling reference for those guys who don't get that. I don't have any build up today, so let's just... Uh, Get into some questions, and uh, we got some good ones this uh, this week. You guys, I can tell just by the nature of your questions, by the way, are um, advancing. Like, you know, I can see that, like, you know, especially those of you, I see your questions each week. You know, in the beginning, it's like, you know, how do I get a client? And then, you know, eventually, how do I scale? And how do I build a team? And things like that. Like, you can see the progress in people. That's kind of amazing to me. Boston. If you were to start lead generation website, or if you were already successful doing it, what niche would you start with? Um, well, Boston, you can you can do any niche that they're already paying for leads in will work. But I'll tell you, if uh, a lot of people really really like the kind of home services, what I call the redneck niches, the fix and stuff with your hands, because they tend to be kind of instant gratification leads. Like if somebody's looking for a roofing job they're they're almost always looking to get their roof fixed today right like they're not, they're not looking like hey i just out of a curiosity what does it cost to repair a leaky roof as where uh you compare that to say somebody's looking for an accountant they might just be curious to know what does an accountant cost and and planning ahead a little bit so those niches tend to have like longer sales cycles so a lot of people really like the kind of home services niches anything that they work with their hands and stuff so um, I have no comment on it. As long as they're paying for leads already in that niche, then I think it's a good niche. And I would specialize in the highest value leads in those cases. Michael, my store conversion is 3% pl or 3 plus percent, but I'm still unprofitable. How can I reduce CPA so I become profitable? My average product price is $14.99 and AOV is about $17.00. But it's costing me about $30 to get a sale, so I'm unprofitable. If I could get my CPA below my product price, at least I would be happy. Oh, Michael, this is a thing that comes up where, okay, so you're selling something. It's, it's a cheap little product for $15. Obviously, with $15, you don't have huge margins. And then what's ended up happening in your case is it looks like if I could just get my lead cost down, then... I would have a profitable store, right? Like you're, you're, you have really good numbers. You're acquiring sales for like about 20 bucks. I'll tell you, this comes up not just in, in e-commerce, but in really all businesses. The number one thing that businesses struggle with is actually their lifetime customer value. And the number one they think they need are more new front end sales. So in, in your case, you're saying, how do I get my front end cost down? And it's not, you know, I'm going to tell you that this is the exact opposite of what ad costs do over time. They go up and up and up and up and up and up, and they're just going to keep going up. So if your only solution to fight that is to try and get it cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, that's a losing thing. So what you want to be thinking about is like, how can I increase the lifetime value of that customer? Could I sell them a second product? Could I sell them something related? Is there a package? Could I sell them a recurring version of that, th those things? Because imagine, for example, like there was a way for you to transition from a one-off sale to that like recurring $15 a month. Suddenly, your lifetime value of that customer, like let's just say they stayed a year, would go up 12 times and you would suddenly be profitable on month two. So I'll tell you, I know your question implies that it's the front end, but it's always the back end. And I have a few friends who, who do this with their uh, e-commerce agency as they run emails and things like that for people on the back end. And then almost always they can make their Facebook ads work on the front end. So it's not a front end issue, even though your question implies that it was. Um, I'm not saying you can't get your cost down, but that's generally a losing effort and it cannot be sustained because you're fighting the very nature of the ad platform when the costs are going up. So the simple solution is figure out how to increase the lifetime value and uh, your store will become profitable. And that's what you really want. Uh, KVNG, I don't know if I'm saying that right. There's no vowels. Uh, uh, the, the whitey in me doesn't know how to deal with names with no vowels. Question for Facebook ads. Newly learning and want to know what I should be doing daily or weekly basis when it comes to managing campaigns. Uh, you know, there's no have-tos really. Uh, 
Kaving and like managing Facebook ads. Sometimes I actually, uh, with Facebook ads, have been able to get away with one like just really boss level ad that kicks ass and just works month after month. Uh, you know, obviously Facebook ads will fatigue eventually, but then you're not really doing much other than just looking that it's working. So your job is to figure out how to get results. I'll tell you my personal philosophy running Facebook ads. I'm not saying this is the only way to be successful. It just worked for me. Four things really matter in Facebook ad. Are you targeting the buyers? Uh, do you have a really cool offer? Do you have an eye-catching image and ideally an image that's congruent with what you have for sale, not just like some goofy like cat? Um, and then as well, the message you put up there. And if you get those four things right, then you'll be able to sell a lot with Facebook ads. So I focus really hard on those four things. And then what I do is I like to micro test. So I'll run little $50 test ads. If they work, I spend more. And I everything I've ever scaled on Facebook ads started with a little $50 micro test ad. So, but make sure you're nailing those four things. There, there's nothing you, there's no course that can teach you all that. You gotta just like learn it, try it. So, um, Play around with those four things. That's what you should be doing, managing those campaigns. I'm not saying all the other bells and whistles don't matter, but think more about the people on the other side of the ad and less about like the Facebook ad settings. Christopher, got a question about how to run A-B testing while still having budget to hit our clients' monthly sales goals. Any ideas for proper campaign structure to do so? We'd ideally like to spend the months doing a round of various A-B tests, but still need to ensure we're delivering strong sales for the client. Thanks in advance. Christopher, it sounds like your ads are at least working to a certain degree, and now you want to take some of it and see if you can improve. You can always take 10 to 20% of a, a client's budget and put that aside and use that to try and improve on the the campaigns you have that are already working. And I think if you let the clients know, everything is expectations in the agency space. If you let them know, hey, we've got this thing that's working, so I'm going to leave 80% of your budget on what's working, but I'm going to take 20% of it and I'm going to try and improve it. We may lose money on this 20%, but over time, if we keep testing ideas, we'll come up with something better and we'll make your results even stronger. Clients are generally cool with that. So uh, A-B testing is just a thing you're going to, as long as you run on an ad platform, you're going to be A-B testing till... Uh, forever basically so that's my uh, uh, thoughts on it because it sounds like in your case you have something that's working you don't want to pause that I would suggest not pausing it but you can take 20% of that budget and uh, you know do something to kind of tighten that up Christian I would like your opinion on a subject how do you get paid when a customer is not in the same country as you uh, easy Christian you just have them send the money up front and then there's very very little of the, in fact I uh, actually am I'm Canadian born, so a lot of people don't know this. They think I'm American because I sound like an American, but I'm not. I've spent a lot of time in America. Uh, but 99% of my clients over the years have been in America. So this is the case with all of my clients that they're paying me from out of the country. Um, there's lots of tools to collect, PayPal, Stripe. You can have them just mail it to you, um, you know, through like, uh, what do you call it, wire transfer. So there's lots of ways to get paid. If you're worried about not getting paid from somebody out of the country, just get it up front or at least get a part of it up front if, if depending on your business model. Um, Rohit, which online tool do you use to get clients for your agency? Rohit, that implies that the getting the clients is the tool and I promise you it's not the tool, it's the offer. And uh, if you have the work, right working offer, there's a lot of tools that can get you clients. Um, you know, email can get you clients. Facebook ads can get you clients. Uh, Google ads or YouTube ads can get you clients, right? So uh, you want to think really about creating an offer that's just so easy for somebody to say yes. I saw this a lot with lawyers where they assumed that the media or the platform platform was the key to success. So I'll give you an example. They would go on a, there's a directory called Avo and they would run an ad that says, Frankie Finn's law firm, we'll fight hard, we're aggressive, call us. And then of course, Nobody calls, right? Because <laughs> it sounds the same as every other fucking boring lo lawyer ad. So then they would create a landing page and they would say, Frankie Finn's law firm will fight hard, we're experienced, call us. And they would run ads and it wouldn't work. And then they would create a website and it would say, Frankie Finn's law firm will fight hard, call us. And it wouldn't work. And then they would try Facebook ads and they would say, Frankie Finn's law firm will fight hard, call us. And they assumed each time, incorrectly I might add, they assumed that the reason the ads didn't work or the was always the media. Oh, Avo doesn't work. Oh, Facebook doesn't work, and all those things. So that that's why it's really not about the tool. But amazingly, when they could come up with an offer or a unique angle or a unique hook, then they could almost make it work anywhere. So it has less to do with um, 
where you're kind of like or what tool you're using and more to to do with like the offer which is why i say the offer just you know make your stuff easy to say yes to more than anything billy i have a kitchen remodeling client with a list of 2000 on their database i don't know how many are past clients maybe only a handful thinking about a thank you campaign how that might look for them would you go with Hi, name. Just wanted to say thank you for being a member of our database. We appreciate you. We just want you to know uh, we want to be your trusted advisor for all things kitchen. So if you have any questions about a kitchen renovation or idea, feel free to call our toll-free number. Um, it's a little bit on the weak side, Billy. I'll be uh, honest with you. I left you a little bit of notes on it. Firstly is uh, you don't really want to thank somebody for being part of your database. Thank them for being a subscriber or thank them for reading your emails or thank them for just being part of your world. Uh, that always just like goes well and builds you points. And then when it comes to like making the offer, the real key with uh, that is adding value. So I can see you're modeling the one we did in the legal space. Now understand in the legal space, there is real world value for answering questions because that's basically what lawyers do is like a lot of it is like knowing how to navigate the legal system. So if we say, hey, call here and get answers to your question, that's real value in that niche. But that's not necessarily true in like a kitchen kitchen remodeling. Hey, call here for a question. That's that's not nearly as valuable. So there's a lot of ways you can like add value to people. You can, you know, um, give them a gift certificate. You can give them a coupon. You can give them a guide. You can give them, you know, all kinds of different things like that. Don't limit, you can, you can include like a Starbucks gift card if you want to break out of the box. You don't have to even do something that's related to their business at all. It helps, but you don't need to. Um, so, one of the things, for example, um, is there's a company in my local area, Detroit, Michigan, where I'm from, uh, that area, uh, that for the longest time has been running, like, get an all-done-for-you kitchen, uh, two ninety nine or twenty nine ninety nine, like $3,000. And obviously, like, it's a set kitchen. You, there's not a lot you can customize, and it's, you know, like, a kind of, like, off the shelf. Uh, you get the same as everybody else, but people love that. It's an offer, and it has real value. So you could easily do something like that and include in a little, hey, we're just throwing in this Starbucks gift card as our way of saying thank you for even considering it. Um, things like that go a really, really long ways and will help them sell. But that's what you want to help them do. I know they'll tell you, oh, well, we need to see the kitchen, and we need to like know what they want and all those things. But if you offer like a, a package, uh, and then they can modify it. It's an easy way to get people to call you because the biggest concern people have is just like the, the having no idea how much it's going to cost for a kitchen remodeling. So those are some ideas for you. I hope that's helpful. Eli, do you bill your clients ad spend on your card or do you use theirs? Um, I've done both, Eli. And I'll tell you, this is actually a big secret of a lot of the, uh, the big ads guys is actually putting the ad spend on their own cards, which sounds a little counterintuitive. But the reason they do it is really, really simple. If you have um, like a really good rewards credit card, then you can get all your travel for free. Like if you're spending $200,000 per month on client ads and you put that all on your card and you get rewards, like you'll never pay for travel again in your entire life. So there are reasons to do it. And if you're also doing like pay per result where you're like, you know, charging per lead or per something booked or whatever like that or per sale or whatever, uh, it makes a lot more sense to put it on your card. But I would say... 95 times out of 100, it, the, the ad spend is going to be on the client's own card, and that's just how that like typically goes. Um, Roshan, best agency lead magnets you guys have seen. Roshan, I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all. This is the best lead uh, agency lead magnet in every niche. Um, just, it's getting loud over here with uh, my neighbors working. I hope you guys don't mind. If I need to move, I'll move in a second. Um, so I'll tell you the best thing I found with lead magnets, and I learned this from a, a really smart marketer named Nicholas Kusmich, and uh, it's called SAGE, which stands for short, action-oriented, or actionable, rather, goal-oriented, and educational. And I'll give you an example of this, but what it works, and what I learned is it's usually a, a best lead magnets or something a client can do. They can download in 15 minutes that actually helps them move towards their goal, but also educates them at the same time. So one of our best performing ones in the lawyer space, I don't know, like 82, 83% of lawyers get almost all their business exclusively from referrals. And the crazy thing is most of them do nothing to make those referrals. It sounds crazy, but it's true. 
they do nothing. So well, one of the things we did is create a little checklist. It's only one page and it lists all the 26 things they can do for referrals. Some of them are before they get a client. Some of them are during the client and some of them are after the fact. And it's just a little checklist. How many of these are you doing, right? And it gives them ideas and they get value out of it and they can use it immediately. But it also educates them in the direction of like, you guys aren't doing nearly enough. And again, it's consumable in 15 minutes, right? Because it's a little checklist. So they get to see it adds on to what they're already doing. So those are the best kind of leads and magnets, the sage, the short, actionable, goal-oriented, educational. I used to think you had to come up with these like 300 page eBooks and, but ultimately, there's so many ebooks that just end up in people's hard drives as purgatory, never read. What people want is something they can use. And so ultimately, a one page usable lead magnet is better than a 300 page one. So, having said that, figure out what your people are, are doing in your niche, move them towards the goal, keep the, uh, keep the uh, lead magnet sage, and those are the best ones in general. Um, Muhammad. I have a real estate client. He wants to generate leads for his real estate business through Facebook ads. He's asking me how much my month, how much monthly budget is required and how much leads will be generated out of it. He also wants me to send a proposal. So what all should be mentioned? I'm working on a hybrid deal, meaning he will invest in ads and I will get a commission only when a sale is made. So how much commission can I ask? Your valuable suggestions will be really helpful to me. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, Mohammed, it sounds like you're, you're getting into your first revenue share deal. I like to high five you for that. I'll tell you just, I, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but this sounds like a losing structure to me. Uh, mostly because you're going to be creating the system new. Not, it's not as if you have a working real estate system. So like to give him any idea of how many leads he should get or any of those things are all just kind of exercises in theoretical, uh, mental masturbation, if you will. Um, that's very different than you have a working system and, and you get involved in sharing. Now, the other piece that's tricky is when you choose revenue share partners, you got to be really careful about setting up small little trials to feel them out. And the reason you do that is because you're getting paid when they sell. But what happens if you get a, a situation where you get a client, which happens often, by the way, who's just terrible at sales, right? Like you'll just never get paid. You could generate them 8 million leads and they, you would never you know, make any deals out of it. So you want to be really, really careful. So what I found is the best way to work with those people is to set up a small first trial or first date trial and usually start with the resources they already have, their existing customer list, their existing referral partners, things like that, and see if you can just generate a sale or two in the first week. And if you can't do it with their warm audience, you certainly aren't going to do it with cold strangers. Um, and then that'll tell you whether it's worth pursuing all the things you mentioned. And then as far as like, I'm gonna, if you're going to write a proposal about you know, how many leads you're going to generate on Facebook, I don't think any of that really matters without... Um, knowing you know how it's going to work so the point of setting up a first date with revenue share partners is it's just as much to your benefit you want to see if they can close and you want to see if you're going to get paid on time because that's another issue that can come up so you want to know those things in the first week and i'll tell them that in the first week i'm running this little first date what i'm testing you for is i want to see you can close and i want to see how you pay me uh, when those things come up and again you want to keep it short and sweet and to the point and you'll have better success with those revenue share deals Having said that congrats for you know getting your feet wet and getting your first one um, Jeremy I just finished recording my second ever webinar after doing my first one a month uh, a month ago or so Does anyone have a suggestion on how to promote the webinar without having a list or much money to promote it? Um Jeremy, that, that's kind of like a little bit, to be honest, a little bit backwards, creating a webinar first and then figuring out how to promote it. Um, but having said that, there's still lots of ways you can do it. So question I have is, is what is the ultimate benefit and who is it for? If you get really clear on those things, you can go to where those people are. So I'll give you an example. Let's just say your niche is e-commerce. You got a whole bunch of e-commerce people and it helps them, I don't know. It helps them with an abandoned cart sequence. I don't know. I'm just like, you know, talking a little bit of bullshit because you left out some of the specifics. Then what I would do is I would go into an e-commerce group on Facebook and I would friend a bunch of the people and then I would add those people into a little private Facebook list. You can add people to just enlist in Facebook and then you can make posts just to that list of people and then you can go ahead and like promote it to them and they and the beautiful thing about promoting it that way is it shows up in their news feed so it it makes them think they stumbled across it rather than you just cold pming saying hey watch my webinar so who who is it ultimately for go where those people are get a list of those people and promote to them i mean it's not uh, it's not 
rocket science in that sense. Um, Nick, what's your nurture process for no-shows? Well, I'll tell you, Nick, right now, zero, because we actually uh, don't even do sales calls in our agency. We sign clients without sales calls now. We just send them a little video, and they let us know we're in or we're out, or, hey, I have a question. We, If they have a question, we answer it by email. But having said that, I definitely have dealt with a lot of no-shows over the years. I'll tell you, the best way to deal with no-shows is, is before they happen, not after the fact. Uh, so one of the things that really, really helped us with uh, our no-shows is into integrating Zapier and something called Sly Broadcast. And what it does is it calls a person up and it leaves a voicemail message. And so we did this, put this in place right after they would book a call. And then because of the delay of the software, about 10 minutes later, they would get a, a voicemail message and it would just say, hey, you know, it's Frankie. We just saw you booked a call. Really excited for our talk together. Just want to let you know, here's what's going to happen in our call. I know you're probably used to like salesy, overly kind of sales calls, but I just want to do an exploratory thing. I'm going to ask you these kind of questions, figure out what your goals are. If we can help you, I'll tell you. If not, I'll let you know otherwise. And I'll point you in the best direction for who can do that. Um, and those things like dramatically, dramatically reduce no-shows. Now, having said that, you should certainly follow up with no-shows. Not everybody who no-showed is a bad lead. Sometimes they just got busy. Sometimes life got in the way. Sometimes they had to run to the hospital because something happened. So, um, you know, just a series of messages, follow-up texts, let them know to book another one. And if you want to, I've heard a lot of people tell me they have really good success with just one or two personalized messages in there so they know that like a real human wrote it. Say, hey, I know life got in the way. You got busy. I'd still love to chat with you uh, and talk about whatever their business name is and to send them a link to, to come book again. Uh, but having said that, you can definitely book agency clients without a sales call if you work on making your offer and easy to say yes to. So I would suggest getting that piece styled in because it's a lot more fun when you don't have to do any um, phone calls in general. So hope that's helpful to you guys. That's all the questions we got this week. And if you're interested in finding a little more about the mastermind, we got a cool little 20 minute video where I show you uh, um, different things that we're doing. And even if you're not actually interested in joining the mastermind, I would suggest you check it out because there's some things we do in our agency that really I think are game changers and just understanding how we approach it differently than everybody else I think will make your life easier. Um, eliminating sales calls, eliminating proposals, introducing passive income, that's something that most agencies just don't have. So if you're interested in checking out that video, let me know. And if you're not already, subscribe on YouTube because I'm uh, uploading these and we're just, we're just gonna be adding more and more cool shit to the YouTube channel. So that's all I got for you guys today. May the force be with you and much love. The kids are out right now, so you'll notice it's amazingly quiet here. And uh, we can go have some fun. So may the force be with you.